It's difficult to know when labor begins, and we talk to patients about contractions, but of course contractions sometimes mean labor and sometimes they don't. Other things to watch for, of, of course, warning signs would be bleeding, or if a patient thinks she might be leaking fluid, then we need to see them right away for those uh, situations. But if it's just contractions, it's probably safe to wait till those contractions are very regular, maybe in the five minute range, before they necessarily need to come to the hospital. But certainly at any time, if they have questions about the symptoms they're experiencing, we want them to call. A lot of patients will ask about the mucus plug and whether that's a signal of labor. The cervix uh, is lined by cells that secrete mucus, and so it sits there during the pregnancy, and towards the end of pregnancy, when the cervix starts to change, soften, shorten, uh, dilate a little bit. The, it, the patient may not be in labor, but the cervix will begin to uh, lose this mucus material that may come out as a plug, or it may not. But it's not a, a sure sign of labor, so we don't have patients uh, call us necessarily or come in just for that. It's a very normal process, or can be, uh, late in pregnancy, but not necessarily a sign of active labor. The mucus plug is not the same thing as your water breaking. And, and when your water breaks, it's frequently obvious. It's a, it's a large amount of fluid and it just keeps coming. Sometimes it's not that way though, and it can just be a small amount intermittently. So if you're not sure, we really need, need you to call us and we need to check on that uh, to see what's going on. There's really no proven natural uh, method for trying to uh, stimulate labor. We think probably it's the best just to not try not to worry about it, make sure you have adequate rest for when labor does happen. Eating spicy food or taking castor oil is probably only gonna make you have heartburn or diarrhea or both. And so you're probably better off just you know hydrating and trying to rest and, and be ready. One of the things I think is very important is to have a partner or a support person available that can help with, with that part of the process. A heating pad on the back, uh, a hot shower or bath can feel very good and be very comforting. Changing in whatever position might be comfortable for you, uh, all of these things would be good. You probably want to eat light um, and um, walking can be helpful, uh, just different positions to get in. Uh, that, that you find to be more comfortable. So once you've determined that you're in labor and it's time to go to the hospital, once you get there, there are other options that we can provide for pain relief or comfort during labor. There are medications that can be given through the IV, and of course there is the epidural. And we want to be uh, flexible and we want to support our patients in whatever uh, way we can. Uh, everybody's different. We have patients who wish they could have the epidural earlier in the pregnancy before labor even starts. And then we have patients that their goal is really to try to avoid the epidural. And while there's always risk with anything that we do, we're, we're fortunate to have something like the epidural uh, to provide such good pain relief for our patients uh, and yet be as safe as it is but there are lots of things that we can do to help support patients who want to try to avoid the epidural by uh, letting them get into more comfortable positions, um, uh, allowing them to uh, uh, have massage or heat or anything else that we can do uh, with our nursing staff to help support that patient. Birth plans became popular back in the 80s. You know, you have to think about the history of how we got to this point, and there was a time well in the past when women would receive a medication and basically wake up when it was all over. And of course, when, when that fell out of favor uh, and epidurals became available and fetal monitoring became available, it really changed the way that we manage labor and deliver babies. So our patients aren't required to have a birth plan, but certainly a birth plan can be like a checklist for uh, going over certain preferences that the patients might have for their labor and delivery. 
I think it's more important to think of a birth partnership where we try to work with our patients individually to try to meet those expectations uh, that they have for their labor and delivery. Our patients need to understand, however, that there are a lot of things that can come up during labor that are unexpected and unpredictable, and so we need to be prepared to handle those things. Most doctors and most patients see a C-section as something that's sometimes necessary, but something to try to avoid. It's always better to deliver vaginally, and, and that's safer for the mother, and in most cases, better for the baby. Now, we certainly have some patients who would prefer to have a cesarean, and we want to honor their wishes. But I think patients should understand that sometimes there may come a point in the labor where the doctor is going to say, you know, I think this is the safest thing for you and your baby. And I think we all would agree that our main goal is a healthy mom and a healthy baby.